but the, this would be the inverse of the higher parallel symphony in which people come in at the, at the beginning. Fill out. Maybe it'll fill out. This is going to be considerably more affordable than, than Mara had in mind. Uh, I, I had a, a need for another reason to write a more or less formula of the artistry, so I thought I'd never do anything about the double purpose. And so you're the great person. Uh, anyhow, what I had in mind to talk about the major influences of mainly people and a sketchy view of my research and a bit about administrative tasks, which took a lot of time and teaching. And then I sort of hope that others will follow suit. And one of the reasons that motivates me to say this is that when I first got here, I would frequently give seminars at other institutions. And usually one of the things they'd ask me to do is to give another, the second one, is just telling you about the kind of research going on in Wisconsin. And in those days, one knew what everybody else in the department was doing. And so I could give a little talk with no effort about what the department was doing, what they doing, and so on. Now we've gotten too compartmentalized to do this, and uh, maybe this, uh, maybe a few shows of this kind might help. So on with it. So I'm starting with graduate school, which was 1970. My God, <laughs> 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 that was a lot of graduate school. Texas. And now, main major professor was J.P. Patterson, and the major influence really was W.S. Stone. And I learned salary going to take makes from T.S. Painter. Uh, most of you know this, but I'll remind you. T.S. Painter is the man who got the human chromosome numbers wrong. Uh, he's the responsible for the 48, and we're insisting on that for way many years. But he, that's well known. But he made another mistake that's uh, less well known, and maybe just as important in the history of genetics. Uh, back in the 30s, uh, there, was a, there was a general idea that what was then called mongolism, that is trisomy 21, really was trisomy. And a number of people thought that. And finally, Davenport got hold of some tissue and sent it to, to Painter to be analyzed to see if there's an extra chromosome. Painter couldn't find any extra chromosome. And so it was reported that, that the mongolism was not caused by an extra chromosome. And I think that set the field of human cytogenetics back for two or three decades. And only relatively, only naive persons still believed that it might be trisomy. And was one. <laughs> and so he looked. And, uh, and found the, found the trisome. Uh, I was strongly influenced at that time by Dijonsky's book. I thought he was next to God, or next to right, which really is the <laughs> uh, I was encouraged to read his papers, and I found them hard. Everybody else does too. But I did study them. And here's, I thought you'd show the pictures. This, the one on the left is Patterson. The, uh, he was most, his most famous work was the uh, Armadillo Quadruplets. He worked all that out and uh, was <laughs> incurred the wrath of the governor of Texas, who said there's somebody down at the university that doesn't have anything better to do than study armadillos. <laughs> <laughs> this was Stone, who was my closest colleague in lecture in Texas, and Dobzhansky, everybody's seen his picture. And here's Wright, a little earlier than the time when I would have read his papers, but uh, what he looked like before any of you saw him. Uh, I got my degree in 1941, moved to Dartmouth College, and stayed there from 41 to 48. And during that time, this was mostly during the war, and I did mainly teaching future naval officers. And I'm frightened myself about how many different things I taught back in those days <laughs> and how little I knew. Like, I just wouldn't dare go before a class now, only one day ahead of the, of the class, no days ahead at the end of the course. Uh, I taught navigation, several different math courses, embryology, anatomy, parasitology, and there's a story in the parasitology that the reason I taught parasitology was that there was no one else in Hanover, New Hampshire that had, in, had, had a course in parasitology, so I was a one-eyed man, and, uh, <laughs> king, rather. And, uh, but as a result of this, I was sent to uh, Tulane University for a short course and to Central America to learn about parasitology. And that's when I met Fred's father. He and I were in this same course in, uh, in tropical diseases. So you weren't teaching? No, I was learning. <laughs> you, I, I've heard you inform in people wrong the other day. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I did. And Russell thought you were the smartest guy he knew. Well, 
<laughs> He's a man of discernment, so how can I? <laughs> I thought he was pretty smart too. As a matter of fact, we, we had mutual society. <laughs> and then once in a while, the genetics course, which is of course what I was hired to teach. Uh, a little bit about my thesis paper, because the subject of my thesis has, have, after lying quiescence for several decades, is now the very popular one. I worked on isolated mechanisms, <coughs> and the paper's buried. It's in the university publication, <coughs> read by three people, I think. And, and, uh, <laughs> but uh, I really discovered, but I didn't know it, what's now called reinforcement. What reinforcement in the, in the new community of speciation people. It's the development of reproductive behavioral isolated mechanisms uh, once, the, once other kinds like hybrids really have developed, and that's called reinforcement. And I found that was true. I found that sympathetic species more often wouldn't mate than, uh, than allopathic species would. But I didn't think there was much to it. I should have made a big splash and I could be the author of, a, of a <coughs> reinforcement. The thing I found most fun, though, was a gene that was, didn't have any effect at all within the species, but was lethal in hybrids, somehow or other. It'd be nice to know what, would, what that does in a more fundamental way. And happily, from my standpoint, one of these um, molarized species is called Loavensis, it was the Memoir Desert, and it grows on cactuses, and it's been a very popular with students of behavior, who, who are studying behavioral their preferences for different kinds of foods. So I find my, that there were three people who read the paper, uh, but all three of them are behavioral uh, geneticists now. One of the things that was going on in Texas at the time I was there was the question that we really raised by Mueller, and that's whether the, uh, <coughs> whether the X chromosome determines femaleness by just having a single gene for femaleness, or whether it's another factor. And, uh, when translocations were discovered, or the manipulation of translocations. Uh, they had a whole series of X to the X4 translocations, and you could put right and left halves of the translocations together and generate systematic hyperpoids in that fashion. And Patterson was on this when I started graduate school, and he was very frustrated. Every region that he, that he could, could make hyperpoid uh, was male, so there was no female gene there. But there's one reason he couldn't cover. And that was, it was lethal every time. And I had a different way suggested by Stone, actually, uh, to uh, get this thing hyperfloid. And I finally did. And the answer was just what we now know very well. There isn't any single gene. It was a great disappointment to Patterson because he thought there was something curious about this region since that it was always lethal. <coughs> uh, yeah. I'll show you the chart because you've probably all seen it. But the, uh, the one thing that I've done that's attracted four more reprint requests than anything else, and everything else put together, is this little chart of the chi-square distribution. I was teaching statistics, we used to say. And, uh, and I didn't want the slavish adherence to 5% probabilities, so I thought I'd just make a chart that showed about the probability for different values. And so <coughs> after fiddling around a little bit, I found a transformation that made these lines essentially straight so that you so that interpolation was, was easy. But I had to compute a few points out, out here, half a dozen or so. And I had been a hand cranked <laughs> computing machine and a slowly converging series, and it took all afternoon to get each point. <laughs> but I finally did it. And, and, and teaching nowadays, Fred, when I teach my class, I tell them how hard this work was, and expecting a little bit of sympathy. <laughs> and of course, I get absolutely none. They're, they're used to pushing a button. <laughs> This was in 1945. Uh, one of the highlights of that period while I was at Dartmouth, <coughs> in addition to meeting Fred's father, was, was meeting H.J. Uh, Muller. He was at that time teaching at Amherst College. Uh, and he was out of a permanent job, quite interestingly. He was there just before the war, and then when the regular teacher came back, Muller was, was left, would have been left high and dry. Uh, anyhow, I arranged to visit him quite often during that period and had a great time. And I think he enjoyed me because the, he didn't have anyone else to talk to that, that he could talk technical genetics with. Uh, and one of the things that I did at his instigation 
at that time, many people, including him and me, <laughs> therefore, thought that, uh, that antibodies were very close to the gene, and maybe an immediate gene product, or maybe even possibly a copy of the gene itself. And so that suggested if you, to see if you could induce mutations with antibodies. There was a little bit of evidence in the literature that that might work. It's turned out not to pan out. But now what I did was uh, prepare antibodies to red-eye flies, absorb it with isogeny white-eye flies, and I should have left an antibody specific for the red-eye for that particular locus, and tried the experiment. You told the answer, though it didn't work. <laughs> and, uh, but it was a great idea. Uh, actually, the first evening I spent with Butler, I was a guest at his house two or three times. And uh, after dinner, we talked through most of the evening, and I spent the night there. And it's the first night in my life, pretty close to the last, actually, in which I lay awake all night from the sheer excitement of scientific ideas. I never encountered a mind like Muller's before, and it was an exhilarating experience. Here's a picture of him at about that time. And another one, a very characteristic picture, explaining to his students how to tell if male and female flies or something like that. Mm -hmm. Another high point of this period was immediately after the war, and that's when I met R.A. Fisher. And everybody in the room knows about, I think, about the Delbrook Luria problem of the distribution of mutant bacteria, <coughs> mutant cells in a growing bacterial colony. And Delbrook solved it in a very awkward way. And uh, I worked on it for a while, about nowhere. But I showed it to Fisher. And uh, Fisher said, that shouldn't be hard to solve. And he didn't say anything for, it seemed like an awfully long time, probably 30 or 40 seconds. But anyhow, he, he took a scrap of paper and drew a generating function and said, try this. And I didn't uh, know enough about generating functions to discuss it, so I just took a scrap of paper and later learned about generating functions. But by the time I understood generating functions, I'd lost the paper. So, <laughs> so we'll never know. I think it's a good guess that Fisher did solve that problem first. It was later done by, was Lee and Coulson? Does that sound right to you? Or no, that's right. right. Yeah. Yeah, point that direction. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> For now on, I would ask Miller. <laughs> anyway, the, um, it, it was the beginning of a very happy friendship with, with R.A. Fisher. I've told this story too many times, but I'll tell you much more that the way I met him, I really got acquainted with him. He gave a talk, an evening talk, and he was in the audience of several, 500 people probably, almost all mathematical statisticians, and it was about the RH factor. And in those days, this was 1946, and the three locus theory of RH was uh, new at that time. I had heard of it, and Fisher lectured on that, and I was very excited about this, about this result. And after the discussion, there were a few questions about statistics, which Fisher more or less refused to answer, and then, especially about degrees of freedom. He answered by saying, I'm the person who straightened out degrees of freedom, and why don't I know how to, how to handle it? And of course, that stopped the questioning. So I asked one about genetics, which is what he wanted. So after the lecture was over, we adjourned to, across the street to a bar and ordered beer. And they'd run out of beer. This was near enough, this was near enough to the war. There were still wartime shortages. They didn't have any wine either, but they did have champagne. So we kind of bought us a bottle of champagne. <laughs> then they said, the North, this was in North Carolina, the North Carolina law doesn't allow you to drink in public, drink champagne in public at least. So we had to take the bottle up to my dorm room, so we shared a bottle of champagne. And uh, it was the beginning of a friendship. It's the best way I know to <laughs> break the ice. <laughs> I don't, I don't remember what I did, but I do remember the Fisher got to be quite careless. <laughs> Here's a picture of him much earlier. This is when he was in the college period, a little bit later. And this is the way he looked at the time I met him. I never saw him separated from his pipe <laughs> for a few seconds at a time. And then a still later picture, which he must have looked like toward the end of his life. I also met Haldane during this period although it wasn't the kind of intimate friendship I had with these other people, but I did meet him at the Genetic Society meeting. And here he is, a little earlier than that, whoops, a little earlier than that period, looking at his, at his and, uh, But my favorite picture of Holland is this one. The picture was made, taken by Klaus Petal, 
when when Aldane was here. And I think I'd like to tell you, most of you already know, uh, how Aldane happened to be here. So something I'm very proud of. <coughs> uh, he was scheduled to give a lecture at uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, one. And they uh, asked him if he'd ever belonged to an organization that had advocated the forceful overthrow of the United States government. And, uh, well, they said, of course I did, and I still do. And so they, uh, they canceled his lecture. And uh, the New York Times, which reports everything, <laughs> reported this, the cancellation of the lecture. So I got together with PayPal and went to the graduate team. I no problem at all. got some money for the Orange lecture. I sent him a telegram that he became a Madison. He could advocate the course of overthrow of the government as many times as he wanted to. Nobody would care. Nobody would care. Uh, so he came, gave some wonderful lectures. And Klaus Pejot took this picture while he was, uh, while he was here. Uh, this period of 41 to 48 was notable in another way, too, maybe the most important of all, was meeting at Joshua Lederberg. This was in the 1947 Cold Spring Harbor Symposium. He wasn't not scheduled on the program, but this is his recombination of coal. I was new at that. And so he was, had an evening lecture. And he lectured, I think, for three hours. Then it went on and on and on. And I was fascinated by it. Uh, but most of the audience were chemists. <laughs> really couldn't care that much about it. Uh, but that started a conversation between Josh and me. And the answer is, that's why I'm here. And because of meeting him at that time, and although I have no documentary evidence that I'm here because of Lederberg's recommendation, he's the only person in Madison that I knew. So I was correct. Here's a great picture of Josh at just about that time. Oh, is that my... Isn't that a good one? I got it from I got it from Seymour Benzer actually. Here's a picture of him a little bit later, but here in Madison. And then this one, well, this was uh, about 1958, 59, up in there. And then the here's a period with Zuo right. This was all at the Jackson Laboratory. One of the interesting things about the pictures of Lederberg is that observers change of weight from time to time. <laughs> and this is the next one catches him when he was at Body Spinist. He, he came here at the, at the university to get an honorary degree. And as a gesture, he gave this, as a documented in this photograph, he gave his medal to the president of the university. And nobody can find it. It's been lost ever since. We made the hearing is what he now. Uh, Josh was quite brash as a young man. In his later years, he's gotten to sound very rabbinical in his different ways. And looking, <laughs> looks too. Uh, in, uh, I met Wright at that same year, and I had just written the paper that in, essentially I invented the uh, Holiday quotation book, but I didn't know there was already discovered. Nor did Fisher know it, because I showed it to him. I think Fisher systematically refused to read anything that all of them wrote. <laughs> uh, but it interests me that Fisher didn't know about this. So I asked Ryan, and he said, yes, that, I asked him if he felt what I'd done was correct. He said, yes, that's correct. He said, but, they, but it, I believed in it. I asked him if he believed it. He said, I believed it ever since Paul Bain first showed this. So, <laughs> so we revised my paper to <laughs> give priority to all of Turned out that Wright was a reviewer of the paper. And the uh, right improved it in, in a substantial way. There's a quantity that I've worked out. It seems awfully simple now. But a uh, quantity that I worked out and said was approximately correct. And Wright showed that it wasn't just approximately correct, it was exactly correct. <laughs> so I think I've invented the situation of being approximately wrong. Approximately correct, whichever it is. It's approximately wrong. The paper was finally published in Wisconsin. Here's a good picture of Wright. Uh, together with another colorful character, more colorful actually, John Maynard Smith. Yeah. And this is great. Uh, Wright was visited Oak Ridge and in his, in his 90s at that time. And they were in the process, they all went to swimming. They were in the process of building a little ladder down so we could run the ladder and looked up and here was wife Wright diving in. <laughs> Somebody was there with him. I can't say much for the form, but it's <laughs> 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 This is a picture taken by Hilda. Hilda. That's my favorite picture of Wright. 
I came to Wisconsin in 1948, and I'll show you a picture of some of the key people who were here at the time. Uh, in, in order, there'll be Ray Owen, who was moving to Caltech, uh, L.J. Cole, who was partner chairman, Brink, oh, I mean, then chairman, Cole, earlier chairman, and Chapman, who I was closely associated with. Here's a picture of Ray Owen. Uh, he left uh, Madison to take a job at Caltech, and then I was brought in to, to replace him. I didn't know him then, but we got to be fast friends later on. Here's L.J. Uh, here's L.J. Cole. Together with a man named Wentworth, who I never did make, but Wright said he was a lighthead. Uh, but he was well known in animal breeding circles. Here's a picture of R.A. Brink uh, in more recent times. Good picture, I think. And Chapman, who was interested in animal breeding and in Wright's theories, and that threw the two of us together. Although later on, we had a little in common. I worked on uh, the first experimental work here was on DD system, DDT resistance and result. And I decided to just mimic nature by putting these flies in a big cage and just pouring DDT in. And, uh, <laughs> and I do it, and most of the flies are dying. I poured more DDT in. Finally, they just uh, walked all over the DDT without being bothered to leave. The cages were white. And uh, I made a discovery at that time that if I treated the flies with a sublethal dose of DDT and then starved them for the next three or four days, then they died. And I'm pretty sure what the answer is. They were storing the DDT in the bed. And if they were starved, they used all this and got a big dose. Uh, now, undoubtedly, I carry a lot of DDT in me because we weren't at all careful about it in those days. And I've used it as an excuse never to go on a diet. <laughs> and uh, the more interesting result of that, but first, let me show you the analysis. Uh, it's, it's remarkable how neatly accumulated this is. It's almost like a selected set of data, but it's just the, it's the actual set. Uh, and I think I might like to claim credit for doing the, the first QTL map. The, 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 the unit, in this case, is a whole chromosome. It's not a very fine scale mapping, but, uh, but the principle is, of course, the same. And again, there is one inter intellectually interesting result in this that I still like to talk about. Not much more has been done since that time. But at the same time I was working on DDT resistance in Drosophila, look at the Bali Schwarza and Michael Carroll we were working on uh, chlorine phenical resistance in E. Uh, coli. And they had, and it's, it's, it was polygenic, at least in their strain. And the, the result is, is striking that the, uh, uh, whereas these Drosophila results were almost completely additive, the chlorophenicol results were very highly epistatic. Uh, and I think I understand why. Because, I, because Lederberg and Cavalli, all the others understand why. Uh, and that is that if you're selecting in bacteria, if you're selecting new mutations as they occur, and the second mutation may be a modifier of the first and have no activity of its own except in connection with the first. And the whole system of selecting one at a time and building them up is a is a, a step by step. It, is, it, it will pick will build up interdependent systems. On the other hand, in the sexual population, they're scrambled every generation by recombination. So unless they're tied to linked, this isn't likely to happen. And I just wonder if this doesn't have the uh, meaning, as I mentioned here, that the, uh, that the various kinds of interdependent processes, which are getting a lot of attention nowadays, by molecular evolutionists, if it doesn't require some sort of equivalent of asexual population, or tight linkage, or possibly group selection, uh, to account for it. There's a paper just in the current PNES on uh, networks of proteins by Edwin uh, Chan Lee that, that I really think it's the same idea. I sent him a note to him I thought of 50 years ago. That was more honest than you all thought of it 50 years ago. Uh, we did a little bit of honeybee research during this period in the 19, early 19, about 1950. I had a student named Bill Lee who was interested in honeybees. Uh, for one thing, Nobody had worked out how to compute inbreeding coefficients for honeybees. Not a very profound problem, but it's equivalent to the ex locus in a higher organism. But anyhow, I worked out the theory for doing this. 
with, with, some, with one interesting aspect, and that is that at that time, artificial insemination had just been perfected. And I think that you know, it takes quite a bit of skill as a, as a use artificial insemination and not either injure the queen or getting stung or both. <laughs> uh, anyhow, these people could do it. But they could, they could never inseminate with a single male. It required contributions from many males to get enough sperm to function. And that, of course, botches up the pedigree keeping. Uh, so I, I worked out those systems of meaning that don't depend on you having to know how many fathers there were. Uh, the experiment that I enjoyed most during that period, though, at that time there was considerable discussion about whether mutations, either spontaneous or induced, whether they could be repaired in the sperm by a long, by some process that went on within the mature sperm. <coughs> and in Drosophila, there just wasn't long enough time, although there were some experiments done. You can keep the fly two or three weeks, but after that it's no longer fertile. And uh, they didn't seem to show much of an effect. But the honeybee was made to order for this experiment because the queen mates only once and lives several years. And so we then let the sperm store for a whole year. And the answer is that there wasn't any repair, at least not detectable by the resolution of these experiments. Neil Lee has since incident has gone on to do other fancier things. Uh, I worked out and enjoyed doing it. A bit about tetrapoid inheritance. Very short <laughs> period of tetrapoidy. Uh, Genetics got a paper by Bennett in which he uh, worked out random mating tetrapoids. And he used methods which it wouldn't be regarded as advanced now, but they were then. Um, and I sent the paper to Zul Wright to review the sense of genetics. And he went back and said he couldn't understand it. And so then uh, we sent it to Hilda Garriger, who was the tetrapoid person at the time. And she didn't answer it for a long time. And it's a sad story. Well, she didn't answer it because her husband was dying. And uh, I made the mistake of writing two or three curt notes to her during that, during that period. Anyhow, we got no answer. So I played with the problem myself and thought of an easy way to do it, much less sophisticated than uh, Bennett used. So that's what this, what this story is. Did this thing get public before yours? Yeah, <laughs> this came out first. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, it's only fair to say, Fred, that if I hadn't known what the result was, <laughs> I probably never could have found it. But that, um, I, I got interested in uh, affecting population number at about that time, and how actually how to measure it. And I had two students or postdocs work in that night in the series. Uh, the first was Rory Kerr, who did just a little actual experiment counting flies and determining what the effective population number was. Uh, he was a bee geneticist, and most of you don't know this, but he's the person who's now infamous for releasing the uh, African bees in, into Brazil. But before I make him look like a villain, uh, he, really, he really did a very intelligent thing. It just didn't work. He was, uh, uh, he, these African bees were very highly productive of honey. So he thought he could mate them or cross them in with the Brazilian strains and get uh, high honey producers, and then he'd simply breed out the warrior-like qualities. Uh, and and what they do in honeybee genetics, or honey breeding, is to have a uh, some slots that are big enough for the worker bees to get through. The opening's big enough, but too narrow for the queen to get through. So they put that on the hive, and that keeps the queen from ever getting out. And they do that, they don't leave it the whole time, they do it about the time that the queen's getting ready to start flying off. And the African bees mature a couple of days earlier than the Brazilian bees did. He didn't know that. So he put this queen excluder on too late. And the queen, at least one queen got away. I think it's just possible that one bee is responsible for the, for the whole pandemic. I think it, it's still a mystery to me why that strain remains so vicious. You would think they would you'd think it would just be diluted out by, by crossing. Maybe there's a strict disorder in making among these bees. I don't know what, but there's something to be understood there that still isn't solved as far as I know. Uh, I realized at that time that what one could define rights effective population number in two different ways. As, as the size of a population that would have the same amount of inbreeding as the one you observed or as one that would have the same amount of variance as you would observe. 
And most of the time, these are the same thing, but they aren't always. And so I worked out a way to get that distinction. <coughs> and this lady got, later got to be a cottage industry. Kimura joined me in this game, and then a little later, Carter Denniston. And finally, uh, <coughs> he, uh, Spanish to this named Calavero and sort of made a career out of working out this particular problem in excruciating, even more excruciating detail than, uh, than we did. Uh, Newton Martin was here as a student at about that time, and his interest was in segregation analysis, which one doesn't do much any longer, uh, with molecular techniques and sort of really that passe. But one thing he did, which had no use whatsoever at the time, but it's since come into use, and that was to invent the LOD score. And everybody knows what LOD scores are now, but I think most people don't know that this is where they came from. The word itself didn't. That came from somewhere in Britain, but Newton Martin worked out the use of the, <coughs> the log of the likelihood ratio, which is what a LOD is. At that time, there were about three pairs of genes <laughs> that were linked in the human genome. That didn't make this a very exciting problem at the time. So it lay quiescent, of course, until the kind of plethora of markers that we have now made it an interesting thing to, to do. <coughs> uh, I'll tell you why how Kimura happened to come to Madison. <coughs> when uh, Morton was interested in human genetics, and after he worked on this fly problem on the Texas population, which he didn't really like very well, uh, I thought the best thing for him to do to learn human genetics is go to Japan, where this uh, studies of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were going on, and Jim Neal was directing it. So I arranged for him to get a job there. He also had a Japanese wife. I thought there's every reason why I should like to live in Japan. Uh, he went there, and he never <laughs> came back in just a few months, not nearly as long as he planned to stay. It just turned out he and Neal couldn't get along. And I know what happened. Nobody told me, but I know. Uh, Neal had the experiments planned years and years in advance, and Martin came along with hundreds of suggestions on how to do it better, most of which would probably would have made it better. But he did, Neil didn't want to change the program that it started. So uh, Martin came back. But before he came back, he sent me some reprints from a Japanese geneticist named Kimura. He just sent the reprints without saying anything about them. And I was struck by the depth of insight, and as well as mathematical power, that this person had shown. And, but I didn't think any more about it. I studied the papers, could hardly understand them. But I understood the conclusions, all right. <coughs> And then, uh, a couple of years later, in the year, early 50s, uh, uh, well, thank you very much. I didn't realize what all this excitement was. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. The Genetic Society met in Madison that year, and it was over at the Memorial Union where the meeting was held. And I was walking down the hall there and ran into a Japanese man who was obviously lost. And so I offered to help him and did it, the place he was going to. Uh, and he told me his name was Kimura. And I said, by any chance, are you the Kimura that wrote his papers? And he was. And probably, I don't know how many people Newton Martin told us about, but I'm probably one of the only two or three people in the United States that knew him <laughs> at all. So <coughs> he brought the manuscript that he brought the manuscript that he and Wright reviewed it in euphoric terms. And uh, he was headed for an appointment at Iowa State College. And Iowa State, they were mainly interested in epistatic variance components. And Kimura could do that, he could do anything. Uh, but he didn't like to do it. So about Christmas time, he wrote and asked if he could come here. And I wasn't sure, actually, because I couldn't, knew I couldn't teach Kimura any math. But anyhow, we. I braved it out. Right was coming at that time. <laughs> uh, so anyhow, Kimura came there. And within the first two or three years, he'd worked out just a number of problems that had been waiting around for someone with the techniques to do it. Most of them had to do with stochastic processes of what happens to a gene selected or unselected over a period of time. Uh, Wright had worked on these things <clears throat> and not succeeded. Fisher had done some and probably could have if he had wanted to work more on them. Anyhow, we went to Cold Spring Harbor to Kimura to present his results. And uh, the paper was a disaster as far as the audience was 
Uh, nobody could understand the math, and nor could they understand Kimura's accent. So, and then when the questions came, the first question just showed the person that hadn't understood what a burger was. Said. But anyhow, then Brad got up and said a very sweet thing. He said that uh, he said only those people who had worked on these problems and been unable to solve them could appreciate the thing that uh, that Kimura had done. Um, one of the uh, delights of his life, and therefore mine by reflection, is that uh, all of this theory that he worked out back there without much use or apparent use, except that it was part of the systematic development of theory, it just turned out to be made to order for the neutral theory, which he thought of. And, and uh, so it, it, a lot of times, of course, mathematics is done for its own sake, turns out to be useful in science, <laughs> but hardly ever does this happen with the same person to do it early in life and have it work out in his late. So in May, which Kermel was a well, was lucky, he was also good. Uh, unfortunately, he died not too long ago. He died on his 70th birthday. Uh, he was uh, he developed Lou Gehrig's disease, and uh, he actually died accidentally. He slipped and fell. But I think deaths can often be worse than one, and this one clearly was. He had nothing to nothing to live for. Uh, one of the things that Kimura and I did doesn't seem like an intellectual feat now, but it had been important. Was just to uh, talk about what we call the infinite allele model. Not very good grammar. Uh, but it's the idea that every that the locus is sufficiently rich in possibilities that every new mutation is to a form that doesn't exist in the population. And with molecular markers, that's a reasonably good model, and that's sort of been the basis for uh, molecular clocks and various other theories that have been, been worked out based on that. <clears throat> and then one of the things that, that Kimura did, this was after he left Madison, but he... Uh, it, it actually started with, let me see what the next slide says. Well, let me show you, these are two pictures of Kimura first. Here's, here is a good picture of it. And the one I like best, if ever, uh, he grew orchids. And Kimura was very successful as an orchid breeder. And, his, and some of his clones turned out to be very successful. And one was the prize winner. And as luck would have it, the prize winner was the one he named after me. <laughs> so I have a bigger reputation in orchid growing circles than I do in genetic, <laughs> which is nice. <laughs> Here's a picture of quite a number of distinguished geneticists. This is Ota, many of you would have heard, in connection with uh, evolution by duplication. Sewell Wright, this is Mrs. Wright, that's Kenora. And this is Mariama, also a very gifted mathematician, and also died young. Had a heart attack right in the prime of his career. Uh, the, my first trip abroad was in 1956, and that was to a Japanese genetics congress. And later, of course, there were many trips to Japan. Uh, I remember this for many things, but one of them is because uh, Haldane was there, he used to give the key lecture, the opening lecture. And he was on his worst behavior. He was on his best behavior in Madison. It was the worst in Japan. He refused to ride in the same cab, same bus, I mean, with the Japanese reporter who had written something he didn't like. And so the reporter obliged him got off and called him and got on. And uh, he didn't like the place they prepared for him to stay. And uh, so they had to dig up something else. I knew the person who was responsible for taking care of all of He said it took 10 years off his life. <laughs> <laughs> and, but the worst of these was that Paul had refused to give his opening lecture. The projection equipment wasn't quite what it was at all. So he just didn't give it. And Beetle, who was one of the world's best gentlemen, uh, said he'd just give the opening lecture. And so they moved Paul into the last. It's typical of Beetle, typical of Paul, but it would work out that way. Small point, but something that gave me a great deal of pleasure. Uh, Waller gave a lecture at our at Dartmouth when I was there, and in the course of his lecture, he said that uh, that a person's name, surname, is linked to the Y chromosome, and you ought to be able to use that. And that's all he said. And, but I remembered it. And later on, Arthur Maines, who was a student, was here, and he was working with the Hutterites, which are a religious isolate that grew up very rapidly from a small founding population. <coughs> 
and they had records of all the names and the marriages between people with various names. So that would be a chance to do this theory. So I worked out the theory of how you could use names as indicators of the life on the inheritance, and therefore indirectly make inbreeding coefficients and such from that. And uh, so I wrote a note to Mother and said that since I was using this idea that came from him, maybe I'd like to know how best to acknowledge him. He said he never heard of any such idea. <laughs> So I don't know, Muller had a good memory, and I don't know what happened. This is some, I'll bet it's something he just tossed off and thought of at the moment and didn't give it any, fur any further thought. Anyhow, I made the most of it. And, uh, and uh, I remember making a prediction at that time, which it turned out to be correct. And I said that this is a good method. It has the advantage of being the equivalent of a highly multiple allelic system because you have all these names, some common, some rare, and a lot you can do with it. But I, but I said at the time, this will become obsolete someday when we have markers on the Y chromosome. I didn't know I'd live long enough for the, for the day to be here. <laughs> so I don't think anybody's going to use isonomy any longer. The Y chromosome has replaced it. Uh, when Kimura left, he uh, he'd had a very happy career here as a graduate student, a very successful one. And he said that he liked, the, liked everything about the place here and that he would find a successor. And of course, he was determined to find a really good successor, and he found one. He's called the name Pure Eyes, I mean, as you see here. Uh, and he came to, and to replace them, uh, to replace Kimura. Uh, and rather shortly after he was here, he, he discovered what everybody now knows, the segregation distorted gene. It was just found as a uh, aberrance segregation ratio of a marker gene. He was lucky, because you wouldn't have found it without having happened to have had a marker linked to that particular locus. At the, at the time, he, I didn't believe it at first. I thought he'd made some kind of mistake, and it was easy to easy to specify the kind of mistake that would lead to these results. But he stuck by science, and it turned out to be correct, and the rest of his history, leading up to Rayla's work and Barry Ganeski's and the, the rest who have studied this. Uh, at, at the same time that uh, Erasme discovered this, Larry Sandler, who had been at Oak Ridge, said he'd like to come to Madison and work on some cytological problems. And he had a fellowship. Could he work with me? And I said, sure. And, uh, but I said, furthermore, he had, because Sandler had written a paper with Novitsky in which they just discussed the possibility of myotic drive. And I wrote my paper. It looks to me as we may have an example of exactly what you've been looking for. And of course we did. And so he went to work on it. And the early days of this were very much the work of Horizon and Sandler. A wonderfully productive team with Sandler talking and Horizon working. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, because Horizon would get cut enormous numbers of flies and they'd, they'd have boxes of flies with a big stack like this by Horizon's desk and a little stack like this by, <laughs> by Sandler. Uh, and uh, later on, uh, Dan Hartle came as a graduate student same problem. By that time we had begun to realize that probably what was happening was just that the sperm were dysfunctional. But that was a hard thing to measure directly in the software. Uh, but uh, somehow we found out <coughs> that by uh, taking young flies, they don't produce very many sperm. It's a countable number. It's a few thousand rather than the billions that you might expect. And so therefore you could actually measure the total number of offspring produced by a certain number of sperm. And although it was kind of a hard experiment to do, it, it worked and uh, demonstrated that particular point very clearly. Hartle, you all heard a few weeks ago, went on in his now teaching at Harvard. Another thing that Hartle did was work with uh, Brian Charles with on the kinetics of, of segregation distortion. I won't say much more about that than they did. Uh, at that same time, another person came to work here, this is Chung Yi Wu, and uh, he was interested in the this system, and as most of you know, but there's a, a segregation distorted gene that acts on another region called the responder. And I had reason at the time to think that the responder might be multiple. Uh, the reason was that um, another student, Terry Little, had found translocations involving the responder. And he found that, uh, that in the course of this translocation, there was SD, there was responder activity on both halves of the translocation. So that meant there were at least two genes. I figured on the press with there are two, and you can find them, there are probably many. So I thought this was probably a repeated sequence. 
and it was a repeated sequence, it could be cloned. Uh, so, uh, Chang Yi Wu came to do that. I, we applied for a grant to do it, it was turned down, uh, for the good reason that he was a beginner and I was not a molecular biologist, <laughs> so both of which are true. Uh, but uh, Chang Yi was, uh, was determined to do this. So he went to Smitty's lab, and spent two or three weeks there learning the techniques, went back and within a few weeks had this thing to the point where you could show the high multiplicity of it. And a lot more has been worked out on since. And the rest of this story is mainly the work with Gary Gadesky, who could speak for himself at the, at the right time. He was here last time to see you. I said, well, when you weren't. think what he's missing yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you didn't hear how I was. Uh, I'll say a little bit about, because I did spend a lot of time on the administrative job. And teaching. Uh, so, uh, I, when I came here to teach the general genetics course, that was the main reason I was brought here. And, and they uh, asked me to teach human genetics, the regular genetics in the fall, and human genetics in the spring, which I didn't particularly want to do, but that was a good soldier. So I taught human genetics, which I didn't know much about. And then a few years later, I discovered that, uh, that they asked me to teach human genetics because they thought that's what I wanted. The, the original plan is to have a course in evolution, and they got the idea that I didn't want to teach evolution and did want to teach human genetics. It's exactly the reverse of the truth. Uh, so they were trying to make me happy, and I was trying to make them happy, and that result was unhappy. <laughs> Anyhow, this is it's going to that later. Uh, I spent an inordinate amount of time on study sections and shared two of them. And a still more inordinate time is acting in the medical school which was a whole lot easier job in those days than, uh, than the job is nowadays. So I won't say much more about it. I, I, still, I will say that I lasted longer as acting dean than my successor to as permanent dean. <laughs> <laughs> there was also a committee on uh, student power at that time. Students were demanding more power, and I chaired a committee that essentially granted the power to them. And it started in I. I was also an advisor to the director of the NIH and was abruptly fired from the, from the chain of administration. I wasn't hired for political reasons, as far as I know, but I was simply fired for that, for that reason. Uh, the one paper that uh, Morton and Muller and I wrote together <coughs> uh, uses the idea of measuring from inbreeding something about the mutation rate and about the nature of the uh, hidden gene, recessive genes. Um, it turned out that, uh, more, that Moore had had this idea and that I had it together with Newton Moore and we sort of worked it out together. So Moore said, let's try to paper together. I didn't want the paper to be written by Moore. Uh, he has a very long style. And so I quickly went home and wrote a draft. And it sent it back to him by return mail. He had a number of corrections to make, but for the most part, that paper is, is, is mine. Um, and one nice insight into Miller's view of things. Uh, he added, he wanted to put one addition to the paper, and, I, and it, was, it was perfectly good, good. But I said, that's not really relevant to the paper as a whole. It's, it's a nice idea, but it belongs somewhere else. And Miller said, well, we better put it in, because if we don't put it in, somebody will think we didn't think of it. So, so it's pretty clear why Muller's papers are all so long. That he wrote everything you could think of. If you're Muller, you can think of an awful lot. We uh, set up at that time some experiments to follow this up, this human idea where you couldn't do very much in separating people from other genes that add up the same effect by having many of them reducing the lethal effect. And uh, rather quickly discovered that most lethal mutations, here as we participated in this too, most lethal mutations are not complete. Most lethal recessive mutations are not completely recessive. They have an appreciable heterodynamic effect. Uh, what Rila did in her experiments was to show a striking inverse correlation between the level of dominance and the effect of the gene. Genes are smaller factors, more nearly dominant, more nearly additive, maybe I should say, less recessive, than genes with 
I was very proud of that paper, and uh, but it, it got some very favorable attention. In one particular place, uh, John Gillespie wrote a book review at the time, and Rayla was there. <laughs> I believe the, you will get to tell the story later on, but uh, you were suddenly the hero in that particular meeting because of the favorable book review. But he has also uh, used this experiment in, in the courses that are taught at Davis. So everybody that's been at Davis, California, knows about the paper by Greenberg and Crow, and who was really his earlier name. And when uh, uh, a Davis man came to Wisconsin a year ago to run the zoology department, his first question he said, whatever happened to Greenberg? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I told him. <laughs> that was Ralph? That was Ralph, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we also, this, I will not get well on this, rather unpleasant part of the story, but uh, I, I soon came to realize that many of Brzezowski's results really couldn't be trusted in detail. And it turned out an enormous amount of work. And in the one case where we had done the same thing, we got quite opposite results. And we, we had done it in a precise way by using marked chromosomes. And he had done it in an indirect way by statistical analysis of basically quite a number of assumptions. And then I realized that, <clears throat> for example, we had something turn up in these experiments. It looked like a curious case of two genes that having no effect and suddenly having a big effect of the favorable sort when put together. And that would have delighted Dubzhansky to have discovered this. But we found it had a trivial explanation. What, what had really happened was a uh, suppressor of mutation for the codic curly phenotype. Well, in South and Elmgast, you would always detect something like that. But in these less understood species he was working with, if something like this happened, you would have no way of and that was the reason. I might say that, well, during this time, my relationship with Dubzhansky got to be quite strained, and I can recognize when I got a letter from him what the letter was going to say, whether it be, if it said, Dear Crow, I knew <laughs> it was, I was in for something. If it said, Dear Jim, it was a nice and friendly letter. And <laughs> eventually, eventually we find out this reason. Uh, one more thing about Kimura. We worked out the average fitness of a population of a particular size with specified mutation rates and selective effects. And uh, uh, I formulated the problem, but I couldn't work it out. But Kimura did. And, uh, and it involved some uh, very tricky numerical solutions. These were back in the days before we had powerful machines. I never did quite understand what he did, but I was pretty sure it was correct, so we were ready to publish this. Later on, when uh, Mathematica came out, I decided to redo this. This was an integral, an integral in which it goes off to infinity at the both ends. And the way it goes off to infinity, of course, depends on what the area of the curve is. Uh, anyhow, with Mathematica, you would do it as accurately as you like. And, and the computer was right on the nose. So I don't know how he had a sixth sense somehow for solving partial differential equations. It was hard on Wright's theory because uh, this shows that the fitness of the population is minimum at the time when what Wright in his theory wants to have happen. We ran a bit specifying the different populations. Uh, so I, I told Wright about this, of course. He said he already knew it, but he thought his theory was good enough to withstand that problem. And he is, and he's stuck by it. Uh, quick mention of some very elaborate experiments done by Mukai and Onishi. These are experiments in which the mutation rate is measured by simply letting the mutations accumulate for a long time and therefore making the, diluting the effort to part, part to measure the rate. And these experiments have been, have involved several other flies. Everybody trusts them because nobody's going to repeat those <laughs> experiments again. Uh, but they've been analyzed over and over again, and uh, especially by a group of people in Europe. I'm afraid that I'm afraid the data had more attention than they uh, really deserve. I'm coming close to the end. The, uh, when Joe Felsen died, was here as a student. He was here as an undergraduate student, and he worked out how selection works in the presence of epistasis and linkage. And he found that the uh, that there was a correlation in the sign between the epistatic parameter and the legacy disequilibrium parameter. Uh, 
neither he nor I understood exactly what this meant, but it was a, it was a new result at the time. He's since gone on to fame in other ways. But this is an undergraduate paper. I think it was remarkable, remarkable for a person who was still an undergraduate student. Uh, Kimura came along later, though, and worked on the same problem. And he showed that uh, uh, that if, you, if the population is selected for a few generations, it generates language that's equilibrium. Uh, and the amount of language distribution equilibrium depends on the language of parameter, of course, but it also depends on the extent of epistasis. And it turns out that what happens is that the population under selection after a few generations generates just enough language disequilibrium to cancel the epistatic variance, which is a remarkable result. It tells you that you don't have to take epistasis into account in, in predicting the results of future generations. Animal readers have done this, but they've done it just because of, they didn't have to measure epistasis. But it turned out, I think, that they were very much really correct. And uh, with the... Uh, I, I was talking to Fisher before all this, and Fisher said that uh, that Cochran and uh, Timthorne are fools, in his words, uh, that, that, that they were trying to subdivide epistatic variance into finer terms, that it doesn't really matter. Uh, that's all he said. But Fisher's insights were so deep that it wouldn't surprise me if actually if he knew the thing that later, that Timur later discovered. One of the happy experiments that we did, uh, Moto and I, was to uh, test the uh, rate at which uh, homozygosity changes under different kinds of mating systems. And one of the ones was actually suggested by Holland. It was a way of keeping uh, of keeping mouse colonies, put them in a circular room and move a male one box each generation, and that generates a systematic way of keeping the records. But the, but the, uh, <coughs> the theory of how much that changed homozygosity hadn't been worked out. So we did it, rather he did it. And he brought the results to me, and I said they're wrong, because uh, writers already shown that you should always make the least related individuals. And that wasn't the case here. So, but I went home that night and verified it for myself, and Kimura was right. So the next day, I went to see Wright. We went through almost the same conversation. He told him that we had a system that changed, actually got to be less than he did, and it is. He said, that's got to be wrong, because I know we're making the least related individuals. So he went home and I worked it out, came back, <laughs> said that in fact Kimmer had been right all along. So what it, it turns out that's interesting about this is that the that as you follow inbreeding over the course of time, if you if you inbreed rather rapidly at first, you have a compensatory slowing down later on. It's easy to describe, it's hard to understand how it works, but but clearly it does. So the asymptotic rate of decrease in heterogosity can really be quite small. Spend a lot of it in the early generations. That's always, I don't think the world has been enriched greatly by this finding, but it's given me a lot of personal pleasure. Uh, now I have, can't keep it going off, but I was a little longer. Uh, I had the idea that maybe the reason for, for the evolution of sexual reproduction is that, uh, that uh, with, uh, with sexual reproduction, sexual system by bunching them together. And that's done especially efficiently for if the selection is by truncation. Uh, it turned out that Kondrashov had had the same idea in Russia, and I discovered he'd been doing it, so we corresponded about it. Then later he came here and we had a happy friendship that I won't say any more about. Uh, except to say one thing. Uh, I didn't take this too seriously at first, because I thought, in, uh, although animal breeders may try, I don't think nature does. It's too fuzzy. And, uh, but uh, Kimura and I were able to show that, that the truncation doesn't have to be sharp. It can be very gradual and still have pretty much the same statistical properties. So since that time, I believe that sort of quasi-truncation selection is probably what's happening a lot of time in nature if there's density-dependent selection, as there usually is, whether they're related or not. We certainly see that in the human population yeah. and all sorts of organisms, too. So I thought probably that uh, populations that subdivide into individual colonies, that the colonies will be altruistic within the colony. Uh, 
And the net effect of this is we'll, we'll be protecting relatives because all of them in the colony are related to each other. So the question is to work out how much that is. So I thought maybe one could just use molecular markers to determine the degree of subdivision. And then from that, infer a lot of the amount of altruism we select. Ken Aoki, who was a student at that time, had some data for Japanese macaques that just fit this, and so we were able to work that out. I mentioned one paper by Tom Nagalaki for amusement value. He was a very powerful mathematician. And we worked out some models as to how the, of how the fitness changes under uh, with, with epistasis and linkage and all the other complications. And the paper, we wanted to use the Newtonian symbolism to use a dot over a Simple to stand for the time derivative and the bar to stand for the mean. And I wanted a bar over a dot to stand for the mean of the rates and a dot over the bar to stand for the rate of the mean, and, which is neat, neat. I loved it. And, but the uh, American naturalist didn't have any type. could put the bar and the dot over the same symbol, so they just left them both off. And of course, that means the paper's gibberish. <laughs> I think it's the least quoted paper that I've ever when involved. One of the things that Carter and I did together was to work out a procedure by which you could estimate the component that the mutation rate is making to the overall phenotype. It's rather abstract and pretty hard to apply, but I think it could possibly have some use. Harvard just the P factor was discovered by And uh, a little bit of my personal things. Back about in the 1992, yeah. there was a mess in DNA forensics because the methods weren't very good at that time. And the databases were totally inadequate. So the calculations that were made, assuming, just trying to make calculations of a random match of two different individuals, were in pretty fuzzy shape. Uh, and there was a report put out by the National Academy of Sciences by Victor McCusick, in which the uh, raised these problems by property. But they suggested a procedure that was just excessively conservative, but that would hardly ever be able to show a match under any circumstances. And there was great uh, distress over this, mainly in law enforcement circles, but also among geneticists in general. And so uh, the Academy decided to do another study. And they wanted a chairman who was not involved in this work and who had enough gray hairs to, <laughs> to command respect. So that's obviously me. And so I was chair of this guy. I didn't want to do it, but I did. Uh, and, and we finally did straighten out uh, into a system. We managed to, to, by that time, databases had gotten to be more complete. We managed to prevent a case for the, uh, that the accuracy of this is such that most of the problems are going to lie in the human treatment of it rather than the system itself. So I think since that time, that's pretty largely determined the, the way in which forensics is applied. The uh, final bit about this, though, involves Shirley Abrahamson. Everybody knows Seymour Abrahamson. He's a disoperative. His wife is the Chief Justice of the Wisconsin Supreme Court. She was asked by Janet Reno, then Secretary of uh, Attorney General, Attorney General she was, uh, she was particularly impressed by the number of findings of people on death row that later shown to be innocent by uh, DNA testing. So she asked for Shirley to chair a committee on all aspects of this legal. And Shirley asked me if I'd be chairman of the technical parts of this, which was a little bit the future. I didn't want to do it. But I have trouble saying no to anybody. <laughs> and everybody has trouble saying no to Shirley. <laughs> you know, that, that, that determines the outcome. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I, so we did issue a report. Uh, the substance of this, though, is that uh, it, it's now become sort of day of a year to use 13 STR loci. And the average probability of a match uh, from unrelated persons is, is in the order of 10 to the 15th or 20th power, minus that is, uh, which is less than the reciprocal of the world population. And that being the case, you don't worry too much about about the randomness of the sample or about whether it was gotten by a database search or 
invitation to come back next week is declined.